Welcome to another episode of Ask the Zamboni Experts. I'm your host, Marty Elliott, and today we actually have Mr. Lugrock. Dave, let's uh, let's uh, bring the audience into this. We're going to talk about ice quality, and there's eight uh, specific topics that uh, deliver to the quality of your ice, um, the do's and don'ts, what affects quality of ice. Why don't we get started and talk about, uh, where do you want to start first, I guess, sensible heat load or ice thickness, water quality? Well, where, let's, where let's, start, let's start off with, let's start at the very beginning, because quality ice is... Uh, what everybody strives for. Um, everybody wants to make a great sheet of ice. Everybody wants to have the best ice. It's um, it's what drives all ice makers. Um, the funny part about it is it all derives from who has the worst ice. And sometimes the, the odd part about that is the fact that the worst ice is very subjective. It, it really is. It's, you know, the, the, guy, the player that comes off the bench and says, oh, there's a horrible rut. I caught my skate, you know, and they, all of a sudden the ice maker's going, what, what, do you, what does he mean? It's, it's, it's a subjective term, the worst ice. It's, it's chippy. It's ruddy. It's too soft. It's too hard. It's too cold. Um, and because they are subjective, it, it sometimes throws people off when they go to uh, make a quality sheet of ice. But really it boils down to trying to find these, there's eight factors that are involved in this um, producing a great quality sheet of ice. Uh, the driver, knowledge and communication, ice temperature, um, relative humidity or the latent load, air built into the ice phase, water quality, ice thickness, and sensible load. Now, if you can control all of these eight points and control them into a point where you're you're happy with what you've got. You can get a great sheet of ice. Now, um, I guess we should uh, glance on the first one. That's obviously um, sometimes not really taken into account, but it's uh, just the heat load in your building. Uh, depending on where you go, we've had conversation. People go, "Oh, it's uh, I've got great ice," but he's in he's in Winnipeg. It's it's minus forty today. <laughs> He has. He's not dealing with any load on his building. Whereas yeah, the we, same individual in Tampa might have something to to say about that. Sure. I mean, the other element that a lot of people don't take into consideration is the R value of their actual structure. I mean, what you see in a, in a 1970s uh, 70s facility uh, in Winnipeg, like you used as an example, compared to a brand new facility that's uh, the E value and R value is just so tight. There's going to be a, a greater load on their heating heat aspect. Uh, comparing the two, if you will, and affects, of course, the quality of ice. It's a, it's something that's often overlooked, and it's a, it's it's the envelope. And that's what it really boils down to. How good is your envelope? How how well do you control it? And that plays into all of these other factors as well, uh, especially relative humidity. But if you've got a good tight envelope and your building's relatively new, and the people that were building it, you have all the advantage in the world of getting a great sheet of ice. Without the heft, without having to worry about anything else, the back door is left open. <laughs> There's a hundred other small things that come into play, especially when you're dealing with this sensible heat load. No question, no question. So let's move on. Let's talk about uh, ice thickness, how that affects quality of ice. <laughs> ice thickness has been uh, an issue for uh, as long as I can remember. Um, originally, the NHL was... Uh, set up as um, they were looking for one inch of ice. This goes back to the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and everybody wanted one inch of ice. Well, I got to have an inch of ice because simply because they were covering the floor all the time, having another event, and the uh, material they're covering with back then was homosote, and it was an inch high. So what you did was you had your covering, slap it down, and then you, you had to cover that one inch of ice to uh, have the next event on it. Now, I think that uh, they're, we're finding more flexibility in some of the NHL clubs, and they're shooting for that inch and a half. Ice thickness is, um, is a priority to be able to maintain a level sheet of ice over the entire surface. Now, the standard now is an inch and a half. That's what I think most of the associations are calling for. But in some cases, I say that depending on your programming, like if I know that I've got an inch and a half ice and I got a heavy tournament coming up on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I'll actually carry a bit more ice and build up that ice on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So I've got a little bit more to work with. Um, and most drivers are well aware of that. Right. And, and, and leading into being able to do it accurately 
to understand that if I only have an inch half of ice, how am I getting to two inches over that period of time coming up to that event, call it silver stick or whatever the case may be. That sometimes can be a challenge for operators and less they're going to go out on the hour every uh, every four hours and do taps on their ice in the 29 different spots to confirm, do I have actually two inches of ice everywhere? So it can become a challenge. Uh, technologies uh, uh, coming at us fairly quickly in, in all aspects of this uh, quality ice factor. One of them is the laser leveler. And, you know, for a long period of time, I was sitting on the sidelines seeing how it worked. It was just something, you know, I don't want to be the first guy to buy the brand new car of one model. Uh, but mm -hmm. it, it's turned into a, a godsend for ice makers. It, the fact that you can all of a sudden carry a consistent sheet of ice over the entire surface. I like oh, that with edging. Yeah, and it, well, you still have to edge, but also allowing the operators to know exactly over the high spot of their cement, how far up or am I putting my textiles uh, for advertising or whatever. And you and I have talked about this and actually in our, yep. last, our last podcast to be able to utilize the system to be able to come down without uh, damaging the actual inlays and removing them safely and reusing them and, and so on and so forth, a long talk. Hey, let's bring in our my co-host, Doug Peters out of uh, Paramount, California. Doug, let's move on to uh, water quality. Maybe you and Dave can talk further about that. Thanks, Marty. D Dave, uh, you want to touch maybe on some of the things that Jet Ice has uh, dealt with uh, over the years, different products, and what can impact the water quality uh, that goes down on the ice rink that uh, the players have to skate on? Water quality has always been an issue, but I can definitely say that over the last probably 20 years, the water quality that we have uh, available to us has definitely improved. Uh, a lot of the older rinks or a lot of the curling clubs um, depended on a water supply that was at best questionable. Um, it really boils down to the, the, the cleanliness of the water. The, the cleaner the water, the better the ice. And it's as simple as that. And um, over the last, I guess you're going back probably 40 years when Doug Moore first uh, ventured into the water treatment end of it for uh, the NHL. Uh, we found that by using a treated water, by removing all the mineral content out of it, you would get a higher quality sheet of ice that would be nice and clean and have the clarity that you need and uh, produce a denser, harder sheet of ice. There's been a hundred different methods of treating water. Some of them are acceptable by industry standards. Some of them are not. The only way to treat water is to demineralize it and remove the mineral content from it. Anybody who's in the ice making business uh, realizes that. And depending on where you go, you may or may not need water treatment. Boston's got great water. New York's got great water. Vancouver's got great water. But when you get into places like um, Florida, where they, I guess it's the Okeechobee Swamp, <laughs> it, it might have a much higher mineral content. Um, and some places out to, um, we have Regina, Saskatchewan, which is, it's, it's farmland and you go down 30 or 40 feet, you get water, and it's extremely poor quality. And you can see it in the, in the, in the, in the, in the ice that you, you produce in the arenas in the area. Not everybody needs water quality. Some places don't. Some places have got great quality water. Some people get a great sheet of ice simply because they do a lot of things right. But if you want a really great sheet of ice, it's just one of the tools that you can put in your toolbox and get a better sheet of ice. So Dave, let me ask you this million dollar question. I'm uh, I'm up somewhere, municipality, rural area, and I don't know whether I have the right water quality or not. What's your direction to me? What do I need to do? All it takes is really a, a water sample or a water analysis. Most municipalities have their own water analysis. And depending on where you go, as I said earlier, uh, Toronto's actually got fairly, fairly good water. The Great Lakes area have fairly good water. It's when you get outside of that area, if you go into some place like uh, Guelph or outside of Chicago, where um, that Niagara Escarpment runs all the way up through Tobamori and around the other side of Chicago, that's all a limestone bed. So it's it it's extremely hard water. It it scales up all of a sudden. I don't know if you've ever noticed it on spreader pipes. The guy's going around with a little toothpick cleaning out the spreader pipe because that's scale buildup, and that's yeah, what exactly. ends up that's what ends up out on your ice sheet. And that's what gives you your, the the ice, the cloudiness that uh, uh, most people be, have come to expect. All right, so we're talking water quality. Let's move into the next topic that affects quality of ice, air in the ice. 
I know this has been a hot topic and uh, a lot of opinions <laughs> um, from all all around the world, uh, from uh, north to south, east to west. But Dave, uh, let's get your feedback on Air in the well, Ice. Air in the, air, air the Ice. Air in the Ice was uh, something that came up, I think, in, I, I believe it was 1994, um, where American Siding and Heating and Refrigeration Engineers uh, decided that there were a number of things that affected the quality of ice, and one of them was mineral content, organics, and dissolved air. Now, uh, air in the ice is... Um, a rather peculiar phenomena. I'm not talking about air bubbles. I'm talking about dissolved air coming out of solution. Um, it's when you take an ice cube, take a bucket, put it in your fridge. You don't see anything in the water. All you do is see the water. But in this case, what to do is take the bucket, put it in the fridge, and it starts to freeze from the outside edge. It freezes from the outside edge. And once that barrier of ice is set up, everything in that water becomes part of that solution. Now, the only thing that freezes is the water. The water freezes. Any air that's in there or dissolved mineral content like the iron, the magnesium, the calcium that's naturally occurring in your water all become entrapped in that ice cube. So that's why when you take an ice cube out of the fridge, you look at it, the outside perimeters fairly clear because all that froze was the water. But as it got to the center, these the air and the mineral content, the dissolved mineral content in water, came out of solution. And if you look at an ice cube closely, you notice there's a whole bunch of little air bubbles in it. There's a whole bunch of cloudiness at the center of it. Well, that's what it is. It's dissolved air coming out of solution. And if you can get that air out during the freezing process or by heating the water, it's it's an imperative. I'm, I'm, I'm still a big proponent of um, hot water flooding. And I'm do really believe that if you want to get a great sheet of ice, you have to bring your water to 120, 140, even 160 degrees and apply it in such a fashion. We refer to it as in some cases as a starvation flood so that it actually snap freezes. Um, and uh, most drivers will tell you that there's nothing better than a nice hot flood. Yeah, well, it, most would, but we know, Dave, there's a lot of, lot of uh, industry experts, or so they say, uh, coming down the pipe saying you don't need uh, 120 to 100. You don't need it. No. I mean, cold water, the same cold water floods is producing the same quality of ice as uh, hot water floods. And I'm just going, okay, which way do, do I mean, the direction's all over the place. Uh, uh, scientific, you uh, can, I, I, don't dis, I don't dispute that you can't cold water flood. You can cold water flood. All you do is put it in your resurfacer and away you go. You got your right. ZAM loaded up and you go out and put a cold water flood on. Right. Does it give you does it give you a great sheet of ice? No. Your best floods and your best resurfaces come from hot water floods. I I I, I, I the town of Richmond Hill, like we they had a one hot water heater. That's that's what I had. It it did cold water floods for years. You can do cold water floods, but your ice quality isn't there by comparison. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, I, I, I'm sure we could go on for a couple hours on this topic yep. specifically, but we'll uh, cut it short. Let me bring my uh, co-host Doug Peters back in to lead us on to uh, the next uh, part of ice quality. Dave, I just visited a facility in Arizona, and their uh, their surface temp was running at about 25 degrees, and uh, they're very happy with ice quality. Can you tell us, uh, you know, how much of a difference does the ice temp make uh, to what the skaters are going to be skating on and how challenging it is, is it based on whether you're north or south of the Mason-Dixon line? <laughs> now, are we, are we talking about relative humidity here? Uh, when, when being north or south, uh, just the, the, the temperature, the ambient air temperature, like I'm going to guess that the cold snap that uh, has happened over the last week has probably made it a lot easier for buildings that are north of that Mason-Dixon than it is for a building that's south of it, where it's maybe 70 degrees outside air. Yep. You, you take the well, – there's, there's two loads on an arena. Uh, one of them is a late sensible load, which we talked about earlier, and the second area is, is a latent load. But with this temperature change, it makes a big difference. Like all of a sudden you've got these buildings and 
the, if the if the envelopes close down it, and you control that envelope, you don't really have to worry about um, the heat that you'll get in Phoenix, Arizona. It's the latent load that you're always worried about. Um, now Phoenix is dry. You're on the relief side of the mountains. It's it's where it's where, where you want to be. And the same as in Calgary and Edmonton, they don't get that. Um, that high humidity. It's all, the air is already dry. Now the combination of the dry air and the cold weather gives them a big advantage in ice quality. What, uh, what percentage would you be looking at uh, in trying to control the humidity inside the building? Now, a lot of people have it, but it's relative humidity. It's relative to temperature. So I'm I'm more accustomed to go to something like a dew point, and we shoot for a dew point of 35 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's just you can buy handheld controllers. You can uh, run your dehumidifiers, set your dehumidifiers up for a dew point. I'm a big proponent of um, desiccant dehumidification. It it it's the most effective method of taking that uh, latent load off the sheet of ice by removing the moisture from the air. Dave, you mentioned a, a tool, a handheld device. You've been in the industry for a, a few years, maybe a few years longer than myself. Um, what's it like now to uh, for the ice makers that are out there? What What's it like for them in comparison? And how did you used to measure those types of things uh, years ago before these <laughs> devices came out? Uh, Doug, it's been uh, – I was just going to turn around in my office here and see if I had it, but technology comes leaping leaps and bounds at us. Um, handheld hygrometers. 20 years ago, you used to have a little sling psychrometer. Now you got a little digital readout that will tell you just about everything you want to know about your building in one handheld unit. You got infrared uh, guns that are horribly accurate. Um, some of the older ones that were on the marketplace were uh, questionable because people were trying to read their ice temperature and getting false readings. But um, a lot of stuff has changed, like even uh, all the controls on the physical plant, the fast ice system, the, the level ice system, all of these things come into play to produce that better quality ice. Marty, you're a product specialist for Zamboni on both fast ice and level ice. Maybe you can uh, jump into that uh, with Dave about how that's impacted ice and buildings uh, in our industry. Yeah, thanks, uh, Doug. Good question. You know, technology has pl uh, played a big role in the industry over the last, I'm going to say, in the last five to eight years um, compared to the previous decade. And speaking of fast ice and level ice, both controlling your thickness and controlling what you're actually putting down, which is the fourth element of any ice resurfacer out there, uh, can build your ice. Um, the ability to actually control that, both the cutting and uh, laying new ice, it is a great asset to have and being able to maintain and have the knowledge and understanding of what your actual ice surface is doing. Um, what do you think about that, Dave? I mean, you have your own uh, feedback on that as well. <laughs> well, actually, I, I actually have carry a toolkit with me and some of it's, um, it's just technology. You drag it around and you use it to your advantage. And um, that's the big part of it, but you still have to have the knowledge that uh, that comes with each one of the tools that you have and that really boils down to a number of factors but um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's now available it's been put it's being pushed we're being pushed in that direction technology yeah, no technology's coming yeah no question we did uh, i mean we we did a uh... Uh, a survey out uh, in the industry to understand what the biggest challenges were uh, for arena management and municipalities coming forth in the next five years. Here's the biggest challenge. Their retention rate and their 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 retirees that are uh, moving out of the industry is something like 27% in the next five years. So there's a lot of new, new blood coming in the, into the industry that doesn't have the experience. And these tools that we brought forth and these options that are made available that are very technical, yes, but are making that opportunity for that new driver to be able to br still deliver quality ice. Yes, they have to be knowledgeable on the systems, but once they capture that, it takes a lot of the guesswork out of it for them that they can still maintain quality ice day in and day out that their customers are always used to. 
I, I would have to say that um, that's one of the biggest wins uh, for the fast ice level ice systems uh, going into municipalities is being able to uh, deliver the same product with brand new drivers in in most cases. Yep. Uh, I think the last thing, well, we've got a couple more things still to glance on. We're going to talk about ice temperature for a minute. I'm really not sure where you want to go with that. but uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, let's talk about ice temperature. It's a, it's a funny thing because uh, depending on where you are, what the facility is, and it boils down to what your driver should know, and what your engineering staff should know, where is my best quality ice. But it's also tied back to the programming. Like if, if you've got mums and tots out there, I'm not trying to say that we shouldn't be trying to save money and run a set temperature all year round. That, that temperature can be a variable. And depending on where you are geographically in the country, you can run. Um, I remember going back to the, the early 80s where we'd actually go into the plant room and shut the plant room down at uh, 11 o'clock at night. Last of the hockey finished about 12 o'clock. We we're running the floor, the surface temperature of the floor at uh, about four degrees. I'm not sorry, at about 23, 24 degrees. And in the morning we came back in and the envelope wasn't all that good back then either. But we'd come back in the morning, the temperature of the slab would be up around 26, 27. And you'd have mums and tots skate around. You'd have figure skaters out on it. And by 11 o'clock, you started to turn the plant back on and started pulling it down that other four or five degrees for afternoon hockey at two o'clock. Yeah, um, that's, tra that's traditional programming. Yep, yeah, and uh, a lot of people still don't do that. They just, they set the temperature in a way they go. Uh, but uh, you'll find that the figure skaters like you, know, like you a lot more when you do warm up that interface. And uh, it, it, it saves you on uh, the basic ice maintenance practices too. I don't know how many rinks I've gone into where um, they've had a figure skating program out there with the five or six skaters out of the ice doing the, they wind up in one circle, pick up speed, go across the ice to the opposite end, uh, face off zone and do their triple Lutz, sow cow or whatever you want to call it <laughs> and go up and do the jump. And then all of a sudden you hear a big chunk of ice blow out. Yep. But that's not, that's not what they want. They want, they want a softer interface where the pick goes into it. They turn and leave. Uh, I don't know how many drivers have driven around and you, I was guilty of it myself when you hear the big chunks being fired into the front of the box. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Funk, thwack. And, and, and like you said, that's just understanding your ice and basic, basing that once you understand your ice, but understanding your programming because every yep. uh, type of programming being curling on arena ice, being figure skating on arena ice or, or regular hockey or public skating, uh, there's temperatures that, that need to be met uh, for that yep. type of programming like you were referring to. Yeah, And that, that all comes back to the second from last is is the driver like, the driver has to be knowledgeable at what he's doing and it's 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 sometime i sometimes find it painful when you go into a rink and you see a driver that just tops on the machine and drives out and dumps out a full load of water and tries to get a six minute flood on and uh, pulls to the gate and drags a slush off of the towel he's, he's good at doing that because he doesn't want to have to get off uh but and then he then they, the next team out there, the goalie standing in water for eight, nine minutes of the first period. It's I, I, it drives me crazy when I see stuff like that happening. I just it, and it, that's really boils down to the drivers should be educated or trained. Um, the, the unfortunate part is a lot of the people that were trained in the industry weren't trained properly. They were shown how to do it by the last guy that left. And the last guy that left didn't do it properly. I think the training and education are, are, are two of the biggest um, stretches that this industry has to has to overcome, especially yeah. the drivers. Yeah, definitely. Turning, turning drivers into operators, and that's where we really classify the two. Like you gave an example uh, just a moment ago. That's a driver. Uh, an operator, though, is someone that understands their ice, understands their ice temperature, understands the programming, understands ice maintenance, uh, understands their ice resurfacer. Hence, that uh, here's a plug for us. Uh, we have uh, Zamboni uh, Boot Camp, uh, where there's uh, available one-on-one uh, -on -one training with, uh, with arena staff and operators, taking their drivers, turning them into operators to cover off what we've just covered off to understand what ice yeah. quality really is. That's hey, Doug, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Ahead, it's just it's the whole aspect that if, if he doesn't know what he's doing, you're never going to get a quality sheet of ice. 
it's, you know, he's got mums and tots out there and he goes out and does the full load, takes off a full bucket, drops down a full load and then walks off the gate. It, it doesn't do that, that next group that comes on any favors. And I know you might have to take off a little bit more, condition your water, shut it off by the time you hit the hash marks. You've gone through the crease, move it off the crease. He has to be trained in all aspects of driving. Marty, if I can jump in real quick, it's it's kind of like Dave. I've always, you know, heard you say when you go out and do your your pitches to different uh, organizations or uh, just talking to customers, you call yourself an ice maker, and that's what I I refer back to uh, Dougie Moore when he was doing uh, his gig at Maple Leaf Garden. It was he was an ice maker, and that's I, I I tell people every time I get on a machine, I'm certainly nowhere close to Marty's skill level. Uh, in being able to, Mar Marty is an ice maker uh, in my books, and I can drive. Um, and I prove that uh, you know just about any knucklehead can get on a machine and drive it around, <laughs> drive it around in circles. But it takes some real talent to be an ice maker and to yeah. be a, a a skilled operator of the equipment. And you know, Marty, you've seen this with people uh, telling you, I'm sure. Well, how hard is it to just sit and drive that machine in a circle? Well, there's a lot more to it than just driving it in a circle. And yeah. Doug, the, Doug, the funny part about it, it is really, it's going to say silly, but it is a joy to walk into an arena and someone do a resurface properly. It's a, like, I, you know, the guy's got the cut, he's got the flow, he's got, the, he's pulling off the crease, he's shutting the water off, and he, he, you, look at, you look at what he's doing, and he comes off the ice, and he's done it properly. That's 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 what makes me happy. Sad statement, that's, isn't it? No, nope, but that but <laughs> uh, Dave, you just gave the definition of an operator, not a driver, but an operator. And here's the biggest thing. I'll tell you my biggest contention with drivers slash operators out there in the industry. And I ask this all the time because I do a lot of the training for the company. How often do you actually walk down your actual pad, be 190 feet or whatever it is? on the outside and actually look at the ice before you get to your Zamboni room and turn the machine on. Do you actually inspect your ice or do you just react based on what's going on with the ice and guess? And a lot of the times they just go, yeah, I just got on the machine and go out and do what I normally do. Well, you know, that's a driver. That's not yeah. a, an operator. That's not someone that it, uh, really understands their ice. So I, yeah. I actually surprise sometimes that you actually see the figure skating clubs the, the driver makes them go out and patch the holes. Here's your slush buckets. The last five, five minutes you got, fill in your holes. It's nice yep. to see stuff like that. It certainly is. I mean, own what you inspect, what you expect, own it. And uh, that way there, yep. you should you should expect in return quality ice every time you come in as a user group yep. based, based on that information. Well, I'm not sure, Doug, uh, Dave, if there's anything else you want to cover up before we uh, say goodbye to our audience. Well, I just think that... Uh, Knowledge and communication is the, is the biggest plus. It has to be. It's a, a training is critical. It's, it's, it's not a job that you can just hop on the machine and drive around. Everybody wants to do it, trust me. But you actually have to have the knowledge of what you're doing and the communication with everybody in the building. Yep, no question. Marty, I'm going to throw a, throw a little plug in here for Zamboni Connect. And I know that... Uh, you're a big proponent of it, as am I, and I think this fits in well with what Dave's talking about and the technological advancements uh, that are available to the customers today. With Zamboni Connect, it's a tool, and this is something I learned from you, Marty, is a tool that can be used to train the operators, that are the drivers of the machine, so that they can become operator, ice maker, whatever uh, analogy we want to use for them. It is something that you can monitor how fast the driver was going on the ice surface, how much time they spent on the ice surface, how many gallons of water. And Dave, you know, maybe you want to touch on on that is should an operator go out there and drop 200 gallons of water on a either 85 by 185 surface, which is uh, prevalent in Canada, or a 200 by 85, which has uh, become the norm of new rinks and the NHL size. How much of an impact is that going to put on that ice surface when somebody's throwing 200 gallons of water out there as opposed to maybe 100 or 110 gallons that they might actually need? That's really, that's really the true issue. A, a, a driver doesn't have a clue what he's doing. An operator actually has inspected the sheet prior to going out on it, and he's trying to hit somewhere in the neighborhood of 
I would hazard a guess about 75 to 80 gallons on an average resurface. Sound about right, Marty? It's about 96 gallons on a typical uh, typical uh, 85 by 190. That's what your that's what your number should be uh, that you're laying down, and that will lay down. Believe it or not, a lot of people don't know this. That will lay down roughly about 132nd of an inch on that whole surface. Um, that's all you need. If you're doing the, if you're utilizing the four elements of an ice surfacer that all manufacturers have out there, most do. What do you do? You convey, then you wash, then you build. And what you're cutting and what you're building should be the same in most cases. What yep. you take off is what you're putting back down. And if you use 96 gallons of water, you're actually putting down 132nd and you just cut 132nd off, maybe a little bit more, but at the end of the day, that's the average. I just want to uh, thank you again, uh, Dave, for uh, joining us no for problem. the third time. Yeah, it's always great to uh, listen to your experience. Dave, you've been in the industry how long now? 40 years plus. 40 I'm years. Starting to, I'm starting to feel old. Well, I was just going to say that's almost as long as my co-host, Doug Peters, which I want to thank <laughs> as well for uh, joining me today. I want to thank everyone for listening to another episode of Ask the Zamboni Experts podcast. If you have a question for one of our experts or an idea for a future episode, please email your questions or requests to info at Zamboni.com. For more information and additional podcast episodes, please visit Zamboni.com forward slash podcast or search Ask the Zamboni Experts on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. This is Marty Elliott, your host, along with Doug Peters, wishing you an ice day.